Papa Podcast presents 2.1 The Atom, Part 1. Adam chapter 2.1. So the idea of the Adam was invented by two Greek philosophers, Democritus and Lesippus, in the 5th century BC. So the Greek word atomos, that's the, in, written in Greek there, uh, which means Adam, it means indivisible because they believed that the Adam could not be broken down into smaller pieces, that in fact the, the Adam itself was the smallest possible substance that anything could be made up of. So, eventually, now in more modern times, a scientist by the name of John Dalton, he came up with his own atomic model in 1809. And John Dalton described the atoms as solid, indestructible particles, as shown here in this so-called billiard ball model. Uh, so he said that these were indestructible particles that make up all matter. Many references, um, reference materials refer to Dalton's concept of the atom. And so we're looking at what's referred to or kind of uh, slang for the billiard ball model. So scientists have modified several of Dalton's ideas on later discoveries. So eventually moving on, Dalton came up with these theories. And these theories, we, you, you can look at the, the, the four theories, and this is earlier on and then eventually they modernized these four theories so he said that all atoms are made up of tiny particles called atoms and that atoms cannot be created destroyed or divided into anything smaller the atoms of one element cannot convert into the atoms of any other element and eventually number three all the atoms of one element have the same properties such as mass and size these properties are different from the properties of the atoms of any other element element. And then lastly, atoms of different elements combine in specific proportions to form compounds. All this based on this billiard ball model. And eventually, scientist by the name of J.J. Thompson, uh, he kind of devised his uh, interpretation of Dalton's billiard ball model. And after the electron was discovered by J.J. Thompson in 1897, people realized that atoms were made up of even smaller particles than they had previously thought. However, the atomic nucleus had not been discovered yet. So we had no idea right, what it was. And so he eventually put together what is referred to as this plum pudding model, or some others might refer to them as raisins in a fruitcake, however you want to describe it, um, chocolate chips in a muffin, doesn't really matter. But the idea that we had this, this entire atom, this, right, and pretty much um, electrons would float in this soup of a positively charged atom. Moving on, now, the Rutherford's atomic model, and if you look at this diagram here, very similar to those uh, the scene changes in Big Bang Theory. So his new model described the atom as a tiny, dense, positively charged core called a nucleus, surrounded by lighter, negatively charged electrons. All of a sudden, from this model here to all of a sudden what's in here and the, the, the positive soup and the, the, the negative electrons floating around in that soup to eventually pretty much all the protons in the center and electrons just floating around uh, aimlessly around the nucleus. So eventually um, he um, a scientist by the name of Bohr, or sorry, by the name of Rutherford, sorry, uh, came up with what is referred to as the Goldfoil experiment. I'm going to share a link to this video um, uh, in the description. But what the Rutherford Goldfoil experiment entailed was we had this piece of gold foil, okay, um, in uh, in the middle. And what we did was we shot these alpha particles through, and majority of the uh, and so we also had this film that would um, detect whenever these alpha particles would hit and primarily they always hit on exactly to the opposite side of the goal fall so right through however every now and then something deflected 
So what was that something, right? So what he concluded was that there was mass in the atom itself and that the mass of the atom is all found in this nuclear core. And, and, and for that to happen, it meant that the atom consists of a lot of space, empty space, and that this nuclear core is what's deflecting these alpha particles into other directions on the film. Based on Thompson's model, his, this goal foil should not have happened the way it did, right? Because according to Thompson, all the alpha particles would have gone right through. However, Rutherford discovered, nope, there is something really densely packed in that nucleus, uh, which are the positively charged atom, uh, sorry, the, the positive charged subatomic particles known as the proton, in the center of that atom. And that was what was causing these deflections. And then eventually, Bohr came along and still some problems with Rutherford's model. For example, it could not explain the very interesting observation that atoms only emit light at certain wavelengths or frequencies, that each atom gives off its own frequency of light. And Niels Bohr, solved that problem by proposing that the electrons could only orbit the nucleus in a certain uh, special orbit at different energy levels around that nucleus. So all of a sudden, these electrons don't just float aimlessly around the atom. They actually float around at a specific distance away from that nucleus. James Chadwick doesn't really get much uh, credit, but in the um, uh, in Rutherford's model, the protons are tightly packed in that nuclear core. However, in that nuclear core, you can have a whole bunch of protons, and that's where Chadwick said that along with protons, there must be some neutrally charged particle in there, and that's where the neutron came about. And they realized that the neutrons and the protons combined form the mass of the atom. So here what we have is a, a comparison of what's referred to as the Bohr diagram and the Bohr-Rutherford diagram. Notice both of them are, uh, are fluorine atoms. Uh, and so here with this fluorine, we show the two electrons on the first energy level uh, and the seven on the second energy level. We still have two electrons on the first energy level, seven on the second. But the difference between a Bohr and Bohr-Rutherford is, well, Bohr said that electrons float around at energy levels. And these are the energy levels right here and the, the electrons that are floating around them. We see that with this diagram as well. But the difference between the two is... Notice this nucleus. This nucleus, we will, in a Bohr diagram, we are only going to label it with the chemical symbol. But with a Bohr-Rutherford diagram, we take into account Rutherford's discovery that there are protons in this nucleus and Chadwick's neutrons. And combine these two numbers will give us the mass. And these, this information you can find on your periodic table. So, uh, looking into the modern atomic theory, um, again, you're going to notice not much change. Uh, so the first part, so now we've kind of modernized Dalton's theory. All matter made up of tiny particles called atoms. No different. But each atom is made up of smaller subatomic particles. Dalton didn't know there were subatomic particles. Eventually, the discovery of these subatomic particles came to be. Atoms of one element cannot be converted into another uh, of any other element by chemical reactions. Chemical reactions will not allow one atom to convert into something else. Okay, so that is a whole different type of chemistry called nuclear chemistry, but it's not net normal chemical reactions. Atoms of one element have the same properties such as average mass and size, which wasn't known back in Dalton's time. And then lastly, atoms of different elements combine in specific proportions to form compounds. So different compounds like H2O, CO2, etc., etc. I hope you liked this video. If you did, do not be shy to hit that thumbs up button. And while you're clicking the thumbs up, click on that subscribe to stay tuned to my new videos. Thanks for watching.